Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone from around the world. I am Ting Rei, Executive Director of 84,000. And on behalf of 84,000, I would like to thank all of you for joining us on this very auspicious occasion of Visak Day, also known as Sagadawa Duchin, to celebrate the birth, enlightenment, and passing of the Buddha. It's been a few years since we last did an online live resounding with our global community. And this time, we're honored to be able to invite 84,000 board member, a widely respected Dharma teacher and translator, Eric Emma Kunzang, to open our global live resounding with a Dharma talk. We are also really happy to be able to offer a simultaneous interpretation, both into Chinese and into Spanish. And if you would like to access these translation or interpretation channel, you'll find them at the globe icon on the right hand side of your Zoom dashboard. And after Eric's teaching, we will launch 84,000's new illustrated edition of the 100 Deeds. And if the internet gods are kind to us, we will have a few words from our founding chair and we will conclude with the sutra resounding of the text together. Okay. Um, And without further ado, may I now invite Eric to speak. Welcome to all participants and fellow resoundees around the world. I'm very happy to address all of you. Welcome to 84,000, translating the words of the Buddha. This time it will be an uh, an introduction to how uh, the Buddha's uh, words inspire, especially the words that uh, retell stories of uh, Buddhas and Bodhisattvas and other practitioners' past lives, and what kind of causes and conditions that came together to bring about a wonderful result in the present uh, life. And we are all part of that, not only because of being practitioners and being sincerely interested in the Dhamma, but also because everyone, whether Buddhist or not, are subject to causes and conditions. What we reap is what we have sown previously. And that is completely in harmony with the Buddha's teaching on dependent origination. Sometimes some people in various cultures have a hard time trusting that there are past lives and future lives, that the mind is something that has a continuity before birth and after death. But never mind, the stories are wonderful. Personally, I never had that problem. I from early age, I had spontaneous trust in the Buddha's teachings. And I read sutras when I was a teenager. It made a huge impact on how the rest of my life uh, unfolded. Especially, I loved the Vimalakirti, Nyadesa Sutra, the Shurangama Sutra, the Vatra Sutra, and the Heart Sutra. And those were available 50 years ago. And <clears throat> sutras, they unfold like a, a theater, like a drama, where there are players entering a stage, they have conversations, and uh, events take place. And the conversations are different from normal theater, in that the topics are very, very deep. Existential questions are being answered one after the other, but much deeper than that also, that of the definitive meaning, meaning ultimate reality, totally free from preconceived ideas. In other words, teachings that go beyond um, anthropomorphic uh, setting of being a person with a name and born in a place and uh, doing things. But the story today, 
the collection of stories in the Sutra of the 100 Deeds is very easy to understand. They are real people or animals that are born in a particular place, that do particular actions. And we hear from the Buddha what the result of those actions were. Why is that important? It is so that we can emulate uh, those people. We can act like bodhisattvas or try our best in our present life. And we will be able to have the same results as they did. Why? Because we are the same kind of people. We are human beings with a mind in a human body right now. And the mind in the human body has a will to make decisions and choices. And we have that right now. Through the sutras, we learn the difference between right and wrong and how to um, aim with sincerity and try to make the best out of our life. Everyone wants to do that, but we don't always know what is truly good and what is uh, negative. But through reading the stories in these sutras, we can hear about how a single wish, a, a short sentence, and a tiny deed can have a huge impact on all our future. When it is combined with something called um, pranidana, it is a half wish, but half a decision. We make up our mind to take a course in the right direction. And then for just a short while, for example, to think of the Buddha for just a few moments, to rejoice in that, to repeat words that are true and honest, and to relate with our fellow human beings and animals in a way that is motivated by kindness and uh, compassion. And when we dedicate the good of that to be for the benefit of everyone, the result will be immense. Just like a past life, uh, the Buddha offered a handful of sand as a small child to a, a Buddha that, that came by. And just because of that, offering a handful of sand full of uh, admiration and uh, devotion to the Buddha, just because of that, he was reborn as a world the ruler. It doesn't, doesn't take more than that, as long as the, the wish and the decision that we, we connect with it is very pure-hearted and noble-minded. And all of us can do that any time in our day, uh, at any point in our life, we can hold up a flower or a candle we can pour a cup of water and place it in front of an, a likeness, a statue of the Buddha or a painting, and then make the wish that by making a gift of this light, may the darkness of ignorance in all of us be totally dispelled. When we hold a stick of perfume, I don't know, of incense, and it's a uh, beautiful smell, we can make the wish that may the beautiful fragrance of pure heart spread for everyone, inspire everyone. May our actions of the pure ethics and morality be an inspiration for everyone. May the water that we pour out, may it quench the thirst of the longing and uh, loneliness and all other kind of problems that people have may be totally dispelled. So in this way, just making a small gift and placing it on our shrine, combine that with a noble wish, the impact will be impossible to measure as vast as an ocean. That is one of the stories that uh, we can learn from the sutras and the, through that we can inspire our lives. 
that is one of the things uh, that I learned from the sutras. Another thing is that we can not only make a wish for the future, but we can make a decision that may kindness and compassion be part of my life. May it permeate the tone of my voice and my attitude throughout the day. Every single morning, we can make that decision. And then the tone of our voice will change so that not only other the human beings, but also animals can be affected. Whenever we speak, doesn't matter what sentence it is, but when there's kindness behind it, it will affect whoever hears it. The way we walk, if it is done with consideration and kindness, we of course will look at where we step and thereby we will not only protect the others, but we will also be moving forward in a way that is similar to past bodhisattvas. In this way, every little act can have a consequence that is beautiful. Bringing a, an apple to school in, in your school bag can have a great effect if we say this is a gift that I'll bring forward to beautify the classroom for everyone. Bring a few flowers to your classroom or to your job and uh, beautify the environment in this way, but always combine it with good wishes. In this way, we don't have to start uh, converting other people to the path of, of the Buddha. Let it be a natural uh, way of saturating or permeating your, your life so that others are affected in, at their own pace. As open as they are, they will receive that much. Very open, a lot. Little open, a little bit. But all of that is good with a little, a, a lot, or an extreme amount. It's the same when we meet representatives of the Buddha today in the form of masters who have spent their life uh, not just learning, but integrating and realizing exactly what the Buddha taught. So that in essence, their realization and what the Buddha realized under the Bodhi tree will be in identical in essence, not in scope. That is very difficult to emulate the Buddha in the scope of activities and benefit. For example, it is said that the most important activity of the Buddha was his teaching. And what we have today in the form of the Kanjur is little more than a hundred huge volumes, sometimes 102 sometimes 103, but they can be carried by a small elephant without any problem. But if all what the Buddha taught in India was written down without exception, it would require 500 elephants to carry all of the Buddha's words. The entire Tripitaka could be carried by 500 elephants. That would be quite a task to translate all of that, wouldn't you say? So what we have uh, at present uh, contained as the Chipitaka is appropriate amount for our time. That which has inspired me the most of the Buddha's uh, deeds and the deeds of past Bodhisattvas is the realization there's nothing that can emulate that. The deep depth of wisdom in the sutras is more wonderful than sci-fi and more dramatic than any movie that I can ever think of. How to destroy the enemy, not only a bandit or a bad guy, 
but the real bandit, which is in all of us, that of blindness or ignorance, and also the serious tight grip of belief that we place into the illusion of I, me, and mine. The deep sutras, they explain how it, through many, many different stories, how we can unmask that illusion. And what could be a bigger wealth than that in our world? No diamond, no amount of gold, or other precious stones could even be close to that. Because for wealth, money, diamonds, jewelry, we can only exchange that for other material things and services, but no amount of wealth can buy wisdom. The sutras not only show us how wisdom is uh, uncovered, but also how it can become our own possession, like our true human right, not only for those of you who are present here, but for everyone you have ever known, will know, and indirectly everyone else. It's all, it's, it's our human right to know what we deeply are, the Buddha nature, and how to become familiar with that through training. And in all the stories of the hundred karmas, those good deeds are helping for that realization to become more and more easy, more and more available, more and more within reach. And that is the biggest benefit we can do, we can do to ourselves and to our fellow human beings and indirectly to animals and other beings as well. I regard the Tripitaka as being the crown jewel of humanity. And with the other teachings, more esoteric teachings of the Buddha, the Tantras, that is the biggest wealth that we have. The act of making that available for everyone is the most beautiful thing that could happen. So uh, I'm daily rejoicing in the fact that Thousands and thousands of people not only are able to give, and to share, but also to just read and try to assimilate, take into your own hearts and minds the real value of what it means to be a human, how to be kind, how to try to be unselfish, and how to be calm and <clears throat> and make room inside for glimpses of insight so that true compassion has a chance to take over from inside. Not only compassion and being calm and kind, but also the true wisdom in an authentic and genuine way that is not polluted by temporary ideas and assumptions that excuse me, are pretty useless sometimes. It's much better to, rather than to be enveloped in a web of thoughts and ideas, to be willing to step out of that and let the masking, now everybody's wearing masks, just for a short while, but let that mask within our minds and hearts fall away for a while so that we can try to be face to face with our basic nature, the Tathagata Garbha. That is what the sutras teach, especially the sutras on the definitive meaning. They teach how we as normal human beings every day can make room for being what the past bodhisattvas trained in and thereby follow in their footsteps to be truly and completely awakened ones. That's what has inspired me in the sutras. And that inspiration has stayed with me for the past 50 years. And I'm rejoicing in the fact that so many people have access to that. First through the 
languages in, uh, that are connected with English, but also all the other languages in the world that will have access to that gradually more and more. If there's more time, uh, Jingri, I'll tell a little story. Yeah? You can just do like that when uh, the time is up. All right? In one of the past lives of the Buddha, he was a king in India. And because of his uh, kindness, he was called King Goodheart. I think one word, King Goodheart not Lionheart, but because of great kindness, he was liked by all of the people of the country. And also he had that special vow he had taken that whenever I have something that I can share and people ask for it, I am willing to give without reservation. And people in, the, in his land, they lived happily and uh, in harmony until one day the neighboring king heard of it and he thought, well, if that king is so deluded that he'll be willing to give away everything, let me ask for his kingdom. So he marched in with his army and the soldiers at the border was told by King Goodhart to just give room so they, they could come. They walked all the way up to his palace and King Goodhart was asked, will you give his, your whole kingdom to me? I'm your neighboring king and I want more than just one kingdom. I want yours as well. So King Goodhart, he thought, well, if that's what it takes, yes. So he gave his whole kingdom. And the other king, he was not so relaxed and kind. He thought, if I don't do something, then he will just come and uh, kill me later. So he took King Goodhart and his ministers and had them buried in the desert uh, up to their neck. And then because he didn't want to kill them because that's bad karma, he thought they could just die on their own. I'm changing the words a, a little bit. So King Goodhart with the head just above the, the sand and the ministers, they were there. And it was totally hot. And as the day, day um, became night, the jackals came out and they were um, prowling and they're looking for something to eat until they saw 11 human heads sticking uh, out of the sand. So the king jackal, uh, he walked up to King Goodhart and he said, I'm going to eat you now. So then uh, the King Goodhart, his reaction was, all right, just bite. So when the, the jackal came really close, then King Goodhart, all of a sudden, he bit the jackal in the neck and held on. Didn't draw blood, he just held on. So the jackal was, uh, um, he freaked out. And he moved his head further and further and the king they followed along further and further and finally he got his uh, arm out and then the other arm and he totally got loose the jackals ran off and he helped his ministers to be free as well it was in the middle of the night now and they walked on foot back to the palace he was still in, without any uh, desire for revenge but now he had uh, freed his ministers. So he thought, I must do more than that. So he walked into the palace up to his uh, bedroom. And there was the king for the, from the neighboring country sleeping in his bed, King Goodhart's uh, bed. So he took out his big sword, tickled the um, bad king uh, on his th throat with a sword and said, wake up, please. I, we have something uh, to talk about. And when the neighboring king woke up and saw that King Goodhart could easily have chopped his head off, he was overcome with, um, with regret. And he asked forgiveness and he thought, let's be friends, friendly nations now. 
without one attacking the other. King Goodhart said, very good idea. Let's do that. And then both kingdoms lived happily and in harmony. I always loved that story and I, I can picture how his head is sticking out of the sand and how the jackals are uh, wiping the um, saliva from the neck, thinking of a nice juicy human head to chew on. But also what inspired me is that kindness is stronger than violence. And that's a very beautiful thing. Let's all try to cultivate more kindness in our lives. That is not so difficult. Before we are about to say something which is nasty or do something that hurts, stop up for a moment, wait a breath, and then let kindness have a chance in our life many, many times every day. That would be so good. And we will be just like King Goodhart or Queen Goodhart, it looks like. Thank you so much. And with this story, I'll make the wish that the activities of 84,000 and all the people who are connected with it and are benefited for, uh, from it will have success in, in your life so that compassion and true insight will overflow from within. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Eric, for your teaching. Um, and, uh, you know, like a lot of times when people talk about or think about karma, it's often linked with a very fatalistic view of karma, like fate and destiny. But um, your teaching, you know, really left an impression on me on, you know, th this hundred deeds is really about how a tiny deed can have a huge impact in the future and how these good deeds are not just about helping us secure a better future life, but really about helping that realization, the realization of our true nature, the Buddha nature, to become more and more easily reachable. So um, yes, this hundred deeds is really a treasure. There are many incredible, incredibly inspiring sutras inside. And many of you will know that we published the first English translation of the 100 Deeds last year. When Rinpoche heard that we were nearing publication, he suggested 100 kids to create an illustration for each of the stories in the sutra. He also suggested that we look for design inspiration in the traditional bound classical Chinese sutras. And we loved Rinpoche's ideas and so did many others. So we were very fortunate to receive many offers of help and support from coordination of the project to the children who illustrated it and to its proofreading. Notably, Yi Jing and her incredibly dedicated design team voluntarily came forward to create a design for this special edition, taking their cue from Rinpoche's suggestion. So it is now my pleasure to announce the launch of the illustrated edition of the 100 Beats. Please visit the illustration gallery on our website and download this beautifully designed PDF. I'm also very happy to share that our founding chair, Songsa Kyanzer Mbache, also wishes to offer his thanks here. I'm so happy and absolutely thrilled that Dodi um, Lejepa is out, um, 100 Deeds, especially um, around um, now. In a very, uh, when we are really going through a uh, really challenging time, uh, I'd like to uh, express my gratitude towards all the translators, um, especially Geshe Jamspal and Kaya Fisher, for really putting so much effort. I know it must be so hard translating this. Um, I, of course, how can we forget 138 children who has done an amazing job in illustrating the sutra. And uh, yes, uh, Yi Jing and her group for making this so beautiful. Um, as you know, 
karma is one of the most important teachings in Buddhism. So hopefully in the future we will be able to discuss uh, some of the chapters of this sutra when the time and the situation is right. Meanwhile, I'd like to just again express my rejoice. Okay, and um, we are very fortunate. I think uh, the VIP is here in person. <laughs> yes. Uh, Hello, just very quickly, uh, my internet is not so good, so I may just disappear uh, unexpectedly. I'd like to um, thank uh, Eric Pemakunzang for coming to this event. I know Eric a long time. I think uh, he, we met when I was something like 14 or something like this. So it really goes way back. Uh, actually, I even uh, attempted to learn Danish from him for whatever reason, I don't know. Uh, and um, Eric uh, has been, uh, uh, has served uh, amazing, uh, you know, living, I mean, uh, some of the most, imp most, um, how should I say, incredible masters of this century. He studied uh, from many, many incredible teachers. Uh, his knowledge in uh, Buddha Dharma and uh, especially his experience with the trans translating the words of the Buddha is uh, really one of the most, uh, something that we need to treasure. But much more importantly, I mean, um, much more importantly, Eric is a real refugee. Doesn't he even look like one today with all his hair and everything? He is a real refugee. He has taken refuge to Buddha, Dharma, and the Sangha wholeheartedly. And I'm, <laughs> I stress this because um, this is uh, difficult. Uh, there may be a lot of Buddhist scholars, there's maybe a lot of Buddhist, I don't know, students, but those who have really taken refuge to Buddha, Dharma, and the Sangha is very rare. And uh, we need to treasure uh, people like this. Because um, as we all know, as many of you know here, Buddha is one this 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 is one person 2500 years ago said that you are your own master i mean that that statement is still relevant today today i mean if you just go to a bookshop you will know uh, you know there's like hundreds of books about management leadership so on and so forth so, yeah, Shakyamuni Buddha was the one who really taught us, who really gave us the idea that you are your own master. This is 2,500 years ago. Uh, this is just one of the many, many incredible things that he came up with. So uh, I thank um, Eric for coming to this uh, gathering and as I think uh, my video message may have, uh, because I couldn't hear and I couldn't really see. I, I only saw a little bit. I thank all the translators, the kids and the organizers here. Um, probably everything what I've just said, uh, none of you have really heard because uh, I don't know. Um, I can't really tell whether this internet is working or not. But anyway, here we go. This is it, finished. Um, everybody take care and um, uh, happy Sagadawa. Thank you, Rinpoche, for joining us. And um, in the video, Rinpoche suggested that one day he could 
talk about this sutra soon, and I hope we can take you up on this, Rinpoche. <laughs> so um, even in the best of is full of challenges, but now with the ongoing COVID-19 compounded the suffering of many and created uncertainty around everything that we used to take for granted. And more than ever, the Buddha's teachings on appreciating our interdependent relationship with other beings and the environment, bring insight into the causes, conditions, and consequences of our actions, and particularly the Buddha's time-tested instructions on how we can confidently ride the horse of our mind as we gallop through all the bumps and challenges in life. These teachings are applicable and necessary for times like this, and certainly for our future generations, who will meet with even greater environmental, ecological, social, and psychological challenges. And this continued relevance is exactly why Songsa Kian Serenbache along with the support of Dhamma teachers and translators across lineages and communities, launched 84,000 in 2010. In translating and sharing the word language that we and many others can understand, we are very simply allowing a great many more friends around the world the chance to read, study, discuss, illustrate, and otherwise be inspired by the sutras. 84,000's goal is to translate the Ganju, the words of the Buddha, within 25 years, and the Tenju, commentaries on the words of the Buddha, within 100 years. And that will be the year 2110. And I hope those very young ones here will be able to access, read, and share with their children the wisdom of the Buddha. Nonetheless, 11 years in, we have now worked on 40,000 pages, which is more than half of the Ganju, among which 12,000 pages or 154 sutras are now published online in English, and they have been read by more than 100,000 people from almost every country in the world. Organizationally, and with your support, we have been able to grow and learn. From a handful of part-time editors, we evolved to accommodate an editorial team of six highly qualified and committed full-time editors, as a result, we were able to publish at an unprecedented pace. Just last year in 2020 alone, we published 4,500 pages. And now two years on, or two years on, we're basically publishing one text a week, probably faster than many of you can read them. And maybe that's kind of like spamming your mailbox in a sense. And though we've had success through our translation grants that have supported over 50 translation teams around the world, we began to experiment with two full-time in-house translators who have made huge progress on sections of the Ganju that require specialized knowledge, dedication, and expertise. In the coming years, we hope to expand this translation team by inviting the best translators to come on board full-time, giving them the tech resources and tools to thrive and to help us complete the translation of the Ganju. And this year, further strengthening our compatibility with the academia, we are offering postdoctoral fellowships to support the translation of texts from the Ganju into English. And in the coming weeks, we will be announcing a formal partnership with a major university's Buddhist studies program. We look forward to new opportunities for partnership across the academic arena in the coming years. All your support over the past 10 years have helped us get to where we are today. Our successes reflect your generosity in all its forms. Whether you read or download our publications, talk about our work with others, or whether you sponsor a word, a verse, a page, a sutra, we hope we can count on your continued support. And perhaps now more than ever, the matching funds program is crucial. It ensures that if you sign up as a recurring donor, your contribution, no matter how big or how small, will be doubled by our generous matching fund donors. And any support, even a prayer for the fulfillment of our vision, is a drop in the ocean that adds to the world's collective accumulation of merit for the realization of ensuring continued access to the Buddha's words and his precious and timeless wisdom.